Thank you very much. Um, so let's see, I'm going to primarily doing a live demo, but I'll start with uh, some slides just to present the problem um, I ran into. Um, so I love TLS. You know, I love encryption because it makes you know enables privacy. Um, and and the problem though is that I I an analyze network traffic for a living. Um, and when the traffic I'm trying to analyze is encrypted with TLS, that becomes a problem. So I've tried for many years to figure out, okay, what can I do with the TLS encrypted traffic without having to decrypt it? So what data can I get out of it? Um, so for example, um, let's say I saw some traffic to a domain name. I thought like, oh, maybe this looks fishy. I don't know. So let's go to the full content PCAP traffic and have a look at what it looks like and see if I can uh, find out any clues about whether this is good or bad traffic. So in Wireshark, you can see that the, this is the server name indication header, the SNI, where the client tells the server which host or which server it, it would like to talk to. In this case, you can see it's called my.mixtape.mo. So that's not a very well-known domain. So that could, I mean, it could indicate that this might be fishy. But really, we don't know. There's no, you know, uh, it wasn't blacklisted or anything. So uh, I don't know if it's good or if it's bad. Uh, same thing on the right. I opened the same PCAP file in Network Miner, uh, which is my tool. And I can see that, OK, uh, it, there was a lookup. The SNI was my .mo .2. Uh So next step is to let's have a look at, at the actual certificate. Because Network Miner will extract files from TLS traffic. It will see that, oh, there's a uh, TLS or X509 certificate being transferred over the network. So it will get that. And if we open the certificate, I can verify the certificate and see, yes, this is a proper valid certificate for uh, my mixtape.mo. And it's signed by Let's Encrypt. And, uh, you know, and, and eventually, you know, the, the, uh, this certificate is trusted by, by my computer. So, Okay, uh, I because m uh, it used to be like a lot of malware that uses TLS uh, in the old days. They used to use like self-signed certificates and stuff like that. So if you saw traffic to a strange domain with a self-signed certificate, yeah, you you sort of know that that was fishy and it was probably one an, an infection. But in this case, it's probably signed by Let's Encrypt. Uh, so what more can we do? Like the last final straw is to look at the uh, client TLS implementation to see if we can fingerprint the client TLS implementation and see if maybe it is, has the same fingerprint as a well-known browser, then it might be legitimate, right? Or if it has the finger, same fingerprint as a well-known malware, then you know it might be malware. But then again, fingerprints are a bit fuzzy and sometimes they overlap and you're not really sure. And uh, so I used JA3 fingerprinting, which is a nice tool for nice way of uh, getting some nice features out of TLS, which you can actually fingerprint. So this is the JA3 hash I got. It matches something called a non-specific Microsoft socket. So it could be good, could be bad. You know, it's, it's not a single tool. A lot of things would match this, would get this hash. So both good and bad. So I run into this problem that Okay, uh, this is I, I used all the tools I could, but I wasn't able to tell if my mixtape.mo was related to good or bad activity. Um, and so this is my problem. Uh, so while I like TLS, the bad guys like TLS too because of this reason. Um, it used to be that the botnets operators, like Charlie Chaplin here, they used to love using proprietary protocols on port 443. The, because they could blend in. Like, they use their own encrypted proprietary protocols. They run on port 443, which are encrypted anyways, so people are not able to uh, analyze it very good. Um, and most companies allow 443 out uh, to the internet. So they would sort of blend in with the mass. Um, but a lot of companies are starting to intercept TLS or enforce that 443 is actually being TLS. Uh, and the malware operators, they're realizing that, like, hey, we can use proper TLS with free Let's Encrypt the certificates. Why bother with our own proprietary protocols when we can actually do like the normal user does? 
and will just blend in just perfectly. And that's the trend I've been seeing the, for the past two, three years, where the botnet operators are starting to use actual uh, TLS with the properly signed certificates. Uh, so here's one thing. Like, this was reported three years ago. So this uh, was at an early stage where we saw this trend shift. Uh, and uh, there were reports about uh, malware actually using Let's Encrypt. Uh, in most cases, the malware author or the botnet operators were not by or getting Let's Encrypt certificates for themselves. Instead, uh, they could just hack a site that had Let's Encrypt. Because what happens now is that all, uh, you know, every WordPress site, every Joomla site, which is just super vulnerable, are running SSL. They're running with proper Let's Encrypt certificates. Uh, this was even a, a malware infection where the actual, uh, uh, they leveraged the, the thing the, the technique used to automatically renew Let's Encrypt certificates and other free certificates, uh, it's called uh, automatic certificate uh, management environment. And they, and within that environment that all encrypted websites have, uh, they would just use this folder called PKI validation and place a couple of extra files in that folder. So in this case, we have this msg.jpg and msges.jpg, like 1.2 megabyte JPEG images, it seems to be at least. But if you download one of them, you'll see that it's not actually an image, right? It's a Windows binary. And if you check that Windows binary on VirusTotal, you see that it's uh, a well-known malware. So the authors are using this PKI infrastructure that we've built to spread their own malware. And what's nice for them is that all the sites that use these, um, this PKI infrastructure, they are, of course, encrypted. So they get this encryption for free. Um, and one problem with, it, with this is that the, the certificate authorities, like, like Let's Encrypt or, or whoever, um, they're, I mean, what they're doing when someone wants to get their certificate is to verify that you are actually you and you own that domain. If a domain gets hacked, you know, that doesn't give us right to, take th to revoke the certificate. You know, the owners of the domain are still the owners of the domain. So we cannot remove the certificate just because the site has been hacked. So that's a problem. Uh, so these certificates will still be valid even for hacked sites. Uh, then this happened because, you know, the, uh, these vulnerable Joomla and WordPress sites, they were not very well-known domains. So like someone set up their own WordPress site and they got hacked. But what about malware that uses well-known uh, domain names for uh, spreading. So, in, or actually for just, in this case, they used uh, Britney Spears Instagram account and put comments on the Instagram account and they would use like uh, zero, uh, zero width spaces and encode data in that comment. So they would parse that out, the infected machines would parse this comment out and get a short string, which they would use to build a bit.ly link, and through bit.ly, they would get the uh, actual URL for the uh, command and control server. So they didn't need to hard code the command and control uh, IP or, any hard, or hard code any command and control during the DNS server into the uh, uh, infected machines. They just told the infected machines to browse to Instagram and looked at Peter Spears' profile, and they would find the command and control machine here. So that's really nasty. So that means that even though we would be able to inspect the traffic, it would just look like traffic to uh, Instagram. They, and this was made by a, uh, a Torla group. So they, uh, you know, uh, these are a, a really APT hackers. But what they didn't do is that they didn't use the this uh, social media channel for command and control. They just use it for how to reach the command and control server. But then this, the, another thing emerged uh, uh, slightly a bit later, where some uh, uh, criminals were using memes, as I say, to communicate with malware. And what they actually did was that they set up a user account which posted meme images on Twitter. And in these images, there were hidden commands that was actu actually used by infected machines to receive commands from the botnet operators. So this means the botnet operator didn't even need to set up a server for the command and control. They used, just used Twitter and posted images to Twitter 
and the infected machines would go to Twitter, download the images, and know which instructions to take. Like, should I encrypt a hard drive, or should I leak credentials or send spam? Um, so that makes it super difficult as an analyst, because I would just see Twitter traffic uh, and encrypted Twitter traffic. And finally, uh, uh, here's a tool where they say, well, I think I like this part the most. They say uh, they're using HTTP2 protocol. And HTTP2 protocol is by design encrypted. You're not allowed to run HTTP2 without wrapping it in TLS. So they're saying we're going to use HTTP2 protocol because this protocol is not understood by many technologies. So that's why we should be able to bypass like IDSs and stuff like that. Um, and that's true. Uh, it, it, there are most ideas to support a, a, you know, HTTP, HTTP uh, 1 and 1.1. There's so many signatures for malware using that. But for HTTP 2, uh, you know, we don't have that many signatures for, for malicious activities. And then finally, what's trending like the, for the past few months is DNS over HTTPS. Uh, Steve Miller um, s tweeted this exactly a year ago. He said that DNS over HTTPS is definitely a thing. I think it will affect network security monitoring and detection in a non-trivial way. Because we used to be able to at least have the DNS traffic, so we can see, oh, here's a client going to my mixtape.mo, mix which is a visitor domain. But if that DNS request will be done within an HTTPS session, we will not see the DNS request. And that's a big problem for us uh, as a defender. And uh, this summer, uh, we actually saw the first malware that actually used DNS over HTTPS in order to re uh, resolve domain names to IP addresses where they would use, uh, uh, use this as part of the botnet. So uh, what I've done is that I want to analyze uh, the, the data that's encrypted within the TLS. And I want to analyze uh, traffic that might be coming from a malware, decrypt it, and inspect it as if it was unencrypted. So to do that, I built uh, a tool called Polar Proxy. So it's a TLS proxy that will take your HPS traffic, decrypt it, and then re-encrypt it and send it out to the internet. But the decrypted traffic, it will save as PCAP files on the proxy itself. So I've released this as a free tool uh, under a Creative Commons license. Um, and uh, I'm going to do a live demo. So I've hidden one of those polar proxies. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Hi, somewhere in here. Right. So here's a tiny little uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, and you could see uh, that on there is a Wi Fi access point called Polar Proxy at CS3 Stockholm. So I've connected to this one. Um, and uh, on that one, um, let's see. So here's a virtual machine it's that runs on this Wi-Fi access point. Nice. OK. So always the demo gods, you know. <laughs> let's pray. I forgot to pray to the demo gods before my presentation, so maybe that's why. Uh, I've logged into this uh, little. Um, Raspberry Pi computer right now, and uh, in a directory called the varlog polar proxy, there are a lot of PCAP files, and these PCAP files contain all the TLS traffic that's gone through them for the past few days, and but in decrypted formats. Um, so what you can do with this one is you can also forward the decrypted traffic in real time to an IDS. So the IDS would you be able to use its alerts it knows about for HTTP, for example, to find malicious traffic even though it would otherwise be encrypted. Uh, what I also want to show is that uh, it's running as a server. Uh, and so it's a service running, um, uh, Polar Proxy. So it starts out uh, as soon as I boot. And if, if I do a, sorry, net stat, you'll see that uh, the Polar Proxy is it's proxying uh, the 443 traffic by actually listening on port 10443. Then there's a firewall rule that forwards all the 443 traffic to this uh, proxy port. But it's also listening on this high port 57012. And what I'm running there is something called PCAP over IP. Uh, that means that if I connect to this port 
uh, with the Netcat client. That Netcat client will receive PCAP data as a stream that can be loaded into, for example, Wireshark. Um, so before, but before I do too much, I'll show you. When I connect to this network, uh, you might notice that it says you must log into this, net this network. So I've added a small uh, captive portal to this one. And then in the captive portal, I also said that, hey, while the closed user is connect connected, push this root certificate to the user. So this is a virtual machine that did not trust my Polar Proxy root certificate. But the, the uh, captive portal says that, hey, you need to trust this certificate to the browser website. So it's like, OK, I'll uh, trust this browser, or my browser will trust this root certificate. We can have a look at it. Um, so the name of the root certificate is Polar Proxy Root CA. Um, and let's trust it, and then press continue. And hopefully, I should be able to browse the internet. Let's see if I just do Google. Yes, good. So now we're encrypted. It, uh, we've got the screen lock. Uh, it says secure connection. But it's nice at least that I get a warning that this certificate issuer, Polar Proxy CA, is not recognized by Mozilla. But I told it to trust it. So good. So I'm not going to start Wireshark, just to show you that how to sniff uh, traffic in real time and get the decrypted traffic. So I'm going to have to tell Wireshark to rem SSH into that little po um, Raspberry Pi. Uh, so there's something called SSH remote capture in Wireshark. So I tell it to use the uh, Raspberry Pi IP port 22 and the authentication, let's see. Hopefully that's correct. And here you can spe specify an interface I want to sniff on, but that's not really what I want to do. Instead, I'm going to tell it to run this command. So it's going to run netcat and connect to localhost on port 57 or 12, and it will receive a PCAP stream. And that PCAP stream will then be uh, relayed throughout the SSH session into my local computer, which is running Wireshark. And hopefully, I will get some traffic. Let's see. So if I'll just reload here. Yes, I'm getting packets. Now let's do the same thing. Uh, this pickup over IP uh, is something I use a lot. So I even built a feature for that into Network Miner. So for this one, I don't even need to use an SSH session. I can just uh, connect directly to the Raspberry Pi on this port 57012 and say, I want to receive a pickup stream from you. So hopefully it should be receiving. Yes, I'm getting packets. So just to may also show you that even if I close the browser and reopen it, I'll still be getting the, uh, you know, the, the browser still trusts the certificate. I only need to just, uh, tell the browser to trust it once. Now it's automatically trusting, hopefully, if I do cool. Yes. And you can see like stuff flashing by in the, like in the matrix here in Wireshark while I'm surfing. Um, so let's search for something. Um, like Tibetan Mastiff. Uh, no, I'm going to search for Tibetan Fox PS Battle. This one. There's a like wonderful picture of a uh, Tibetan fox trying to catch a marmot recently. Uh, yeah, it looks like this. Uh, and someone posted like on 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 Reddit and said like, let's do a um, Photoshop battle. And let's see, I really like. Hopefully this one. Just, I'm just like, I, I could have visited in any sites. I just like, why not show a, a nice picture while I'm at it? So they do like stuff like this, where like he's, they're performing and they do nice remixes of this. I really like the, oh, There are so many nice pictures here, so uh, I, I, you could probably not open all of them. 
but I would like to. So, okay, so we, we should have uh, now gotten some traffic. Uh, let's uh, go back to Wireshark and see if we can find this, my search. Um, so I searched for Tibetan Fox. Um, so HTTP dot request uh, URI contains Tibetan like this. Okay, so I got some traffic here. Let's see what this is. Uh, it's HTTP traffic, but it's not to Google. This is not to Google either. So somewhere in the in the in my query string, there's probably this string Tibetan. It's and it was sent because I visited Reddit. Uh, and then there's some tracker scripts that say like, oh, Eric is visiting Reddit and he searched for Tibetan. Let's send that to the tracker so we can track him and know that he's super interested in Tibetan foxes. Uh, but I'm not seeing the Google search. So any ideas why I'm not seeing the Google search here? So I can try a different way, like, like, okay, maybe it wasn't HTTP, maybe it's the Tibetan string was sent in something else. So I could do frame contains Tibetan, to say, okay, show me any pack, any uh, frame that has the string Tibetan in it. And I get a few extra strings, uh, but not really what I'm looking for. I would like to see my actual Google query. And the problem is that uh, Google uses HTTP2. And HTTP2 is a completely different protocol from a all the HTTP1 stuff. So I have to use a completely different syntax in Wireshark. So I have to do uh, HTTP2 head header uh, value, header value. So I'm going to say one of the HTTP2 headers should somewhere contain the string Tibetan. And this seems to be working better. So here you can see my search. And this is quite nice. I can see search equals Q Tibetan, and then you can see I started with typing Tibetan Mastiff. Can you see this? Ma mast Mastiff, right? And then I changed my mind. No, I'm gonna not going to search for that. I'm going to search for Tibetan Fox, right? So I, I never press enter when I type Tibetan Mastiff, but that's sent to Google anyway. They know what you're searching for. Uh, without you even pressing enter, because they want to provide you a suggestion and saying, like, yeah, maybe you want to search for Tibetan Mastiff, or maybe you want to search for Tibetan monks, or whatever. Uh, and the uh, second reason is that they also want to predict what you're searching for so that they can grab the search results and give them to you as soon as possible, because faster search results is something that all search engines want to have. So uh, that's why you can see this nice pattern. Uh, hopefully, I should be able to see something in Network Miner, too. Um, let's see. Oops. The the query string for oh, there's so much data right now. Let's see. The query string is sent with a Q to network miner. So let's see that the parameter name should have the Q in it, right? So here you can see T T I T B T N, and you can see the whole thing I'm searching for. Uh, and Tibetan Fox PS Battle. That was the end. What I was searching for. Um, Hopefully, I should see some images too. All these small GIFs are like these one pixel um, tracker, cook, tracker stuff that people send all over. So it's interesting to see how the majority of my images are actually just trackers. So only a smaller part of my images are stuff I really want to see. So here's like the network miner parsed this out of the network traffic. And I have this file on disk on my analysis workstation right now, just because that image was sent through a TLS session uh, on this proxy. So let's try some more traffic. What more can we do? So if we would be, uh, let's see, using CS3. Uh, this is quite nice. If you use the images tab and you just place it to the left and this one to the right. And let's go to CS3 Stockholm. You can sort of see in real time as, oh, I'll just scroll down here, as the web page is being loaded. Uh, it's, I think it's still loading. Yeah, now you can see the images. So this is a cool way you can actually, are, you're actually able to sort of in real, real time see what someone is doing on the internet just by looking at the images. And this, so this is one of the images of the lab. So I'm going to set up this polar proxy in this lab. Once I'm for down later on, hopefully I'll get it working there so you can interact with it. And I'll try to hang around there to show you how it can be used. But let's see where malware and we're in post stuff 
to our command and control server. In this case, I haven't set up a command and control server for this, but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, leverage pastebin. So some malware uses pastebin to, uh, as command and control. There has been incidents like that too. Um, but Okay, I understand. Hello, CS3. I am a malware. Let's say let's expire in an hour and and create the paste. So hopefully we should be able to see this because if malware is pa pasting stuff to paste bin, uh, we would like to be able to see that. Okay, so. so okay, it's posted. And going back to Wireshark, HTTP host contains pastebin. So none of the hosts in the network traffic contains pastebin. Again, that's probably because pastebin has moved to HTTP2. Actually, the majority of all the traffic on internet is HTTP2 nowadays. HTTP is like only a few sites use that. So I need to do HTTP2. Uh, headers of all oh, like right nice it gave me this because I just did it right before. So the name instead of typing head HTTP host you have to type HTTP headers dot authority um, contains uh, pastebin. Uh, yeah, one more thing I really want to show you before I move on to the next thing is if I do follow this stream here on this HTTP two two traffic, it looks like this. So I told you that I'm getting decrypted traffic into Wireshark, but this doesn't look very decrypted, right? So why do I see this gibberish when I was, would like to see like, something I can read with URIs and host names and uh, uh, user agents? The thing is, HP2 is using something called HPAC, which is header pack. So it's, in compromise, or, uh, it's compressing all the data that's been transferred, even like HP headers are compressed using this HPAC algorithm. So that's why you, you cannot do grep in even the decrypted traffic to find the string you're looking for, because you need to actually parse the HP2 protocol to get this HPAC data and uh, uh, de like decompress it, and then you can search it. So that's uh, uh, important to be aware of. Um, so let's go. So right now I'm going to say, okay, let's look at when well, the header contains pastebin. So it, it's the authority should be pastebin. That's the server name of the web server. And I would like to look at post requests. So I found one post request. Hopefully this should be my post. Um, uh, the problem is all I see here is the is the headers. I'm not seeing the actual data. It's saying that yeah, I'm going to post some data to you. Um, and the, 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 but the bytes come later in the stream. And it's sort of difficult to, to move along the stream in HTTP2, but they have made it nice. Uh, there is one nice way you can do this. So you have to learn some new tricks in Wireshark to do this. So first, we're going to filter on the TCP session. So this, in this case, the TCP session is called uh, number 202 by Wireshark. And then in this TCP session, there will be a lot of small uh, streams go into pastebin from the browser. So I'm going to prepare and select it. So in each such small stream has its own unique identifier. So the stream 77 seems to be the stuff where I'm posting data. So you see here's the post request and here comes some data. Um, and here comes some more data. And this looks like it could be the data I posted. So let's see. Yes, paste code, hello CS3, I, I am, yeah, hello CS3, I am a malware, right? So it's possible to decrypt, to actually extract it, but it's, it's a bit difficult. Um, you can use Network Miner to do this too. Let's see, you can look in the files tab, so Network Miner extracts all the, all the files for us. Um, and hopefully, if I just do paste bin, uh, 
and post. Let's see, I want all words to be visible somewhere. Yes, we can see that 999 bytes have been posted. Uh, let's have a look. It's just a notepad. And uh, yeah, hello, C3, I'm a malware. So it's there. So that's uh, super convenient to be able to get the data. Um, let's see what I have, how much time I have. I think I can do a, s a final demo for uh, uh, Twitter. So let's visit Twitter. So let's say um, now I'm going to uh, pretend to be a uh, a malware that uh, uses Twitter. So uh, I set up a Twitter account. So hopefully uh, Twitter will accept this. And they haven't like removed it yet. Okay, so I got in. So actually, just the first thing I want to show you, uh, there is something called Credentials tab in Network Miner, which is uh, a bit scary sometimes. Uh, most of these credentials are just cookies. Uh, let's say that we don't want to look at cookies. And look, here's uh, Mallory's Twitter account. Um, so you can see his password is command and control. So Network Miner has extracted this for us already. Um, but right now, we just want to verify that we can actually also capture what Mallory is sending on Twitter. So let's tweet something. Hello, CS3. OK, let's tweet this. And hopefully, you should uh, see this. Um, Sorry, I made some mistake. Yeah, right, the data is posted, so that's why I'm not seeing it. So if we go back to Wireshark, for example, um, we can do HP to uh, data dot data. This is a different way. I know in HP2, there's going to be a data chunk, and that data chunk is going to have a different data chunk, and that's going to uh, contain the string, uh, uh, hello. I'm not sure. Oh, no. CS3, something like this. Oh, sorry. This data should contain. Right. Um, okay, it didn't. Okay, nice suggestions I'm getting for people to follow. That's not. <laughs> That's not what I want. Um, let's do it like this instead. Uh, Twitter posts. Uh, so let's see what data has been posted to Twitter. Uh, you can see that all of this is HTTP2 posts. So there's a lot of data being posted to Twitter. And it should be posted from my. So sorry about this. This is always the thing with live demos. Things happen, and for some reason, they don't show up as you intend to. OK, so uh, just ignore this for now. One final thing I want to show you. Right, I forgot. There's, this is the final thing. Uh, is Let's say the, the malware uses um, DNS over HTTPS. And in this case, this browser actually was set up to do this. So if you go to Firefox settings, and you go to the network settings, at the bottom here, you can set up that to use DNS over HTTPS. And it's, it, there's only, unfortunately, there's like only one provider, which is Cloudflare. So we have to run this through Cloudflare and, uh, unless you've set up your own or have some friend who runs a service like this. And since this has been running, uh, there have been nor no normal DNS requests. So all the DNS requests from this browser has gone through HTTPS. 
And this means that it has been decrypted by the proxy, and I should be able to see it both here. So you can see, yes. So, and the way DNS over HTTPS works is that the client does an HTTP post to say, hey, this, and then post the data, which would normally be sent over UDP in, as a DNS request. And then the server responds with, hey, here's a file for you. But the file is actually just a DNS response, which the browser opens. Uh, but this can be parsed. So I've written a parser for this in Network Miner. So you can see that, OK, my browser has been uh, asking for a lot of domains, and it has been properly resolved. resolved. If, if you want to see this in detail, you can actually just type DNS as a display filter in Wireshark. You can see this thing that, OK, there it's TCP. Normally, there would be a TLS layer inside TCP. But since Polar Proxy has removed that TLS for us, we can see that, OK, it's TCP. Then it's HP2. And inside HP2, there's a data chunk. And this data chunk is a DNS response. So you can see. And DNS response always contains a copy of the uh, query. So you can see it was asking for this domain, and, and here's the answer. So for DNS, you can actually use the same type of uh, display filters you would normally use in Wireshark when analyzing DNS, uh, even though it's wrapped within HTTPS or HTTP2. So uh, that really helps a lot. Um, right. So in summary, um, you know, we leverage TLS to protect our privacy, but so does malware nowadays. Uh, so they leverage the nice thing about free X509 certificates, uh, or they just hack a website, because all websites have proper X509 certificates right now. Uh, and they can leverage social media. They're even moving into HTTP2, just because we don't have IDSs that know how to do signatures on HTTP2. And there's even now malware that uses DNS over HTTPS, so that as a defender, you know, I've always been reluctant to actually break crypto from users. I like the end-to-end -end crypto principle, but you know, I don't see any other way out of this at the moment. We have to break crypto and inspect the TLS traffic. So um, if you buy an appliance, because there are some super expensive appliances that can do that, make sure you can, you're not locked into analyzing the decrypted traffic in the appliance. Make sure you can get stream data, so you can stream the, the decrypted traffic to, for example, an IDS, or just get the PCAP and load it into Wireshark or whatever so that you can analyze the traffic yourself and are not locked into the appliance. Because most appliances, they just decrypt the traffic and then tell you, you can look at the decrypted traffic in our tools, but those tools are usually not very good. So make sure you use something where you can actually get the decrypted traffic out of the appliance. And if you just want to play around, feel free to download uh, Polar Proxy. It's free. You can just do, go to polarproxy.com and download it. Uh, and install it so that you can play around with this decryption, see if this makes sense, sense for you. I, as incident responders, I also recommend people to use Polar Proxy, even though you might have a corporate way of uh, intercepting TLS, because as an incident responder, sometimes you find like, hey, this machine seems to be infected. Then you can intercept the traffic from that machine that's infected and do the analysis much more swiftly than using the you know commercial appliance you might have. So then you just use Polar Proxy and just forward the traffic from that particular IP through your proxy and get it decrypted. Um, so those are probably my final words for today. So uh, yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>